Hey, good morning, everyone. Marty Mazzori here, May 25th, 2024, with your weekly economic update. Going to keep this one rolling today. We'll talk about a few inputs to our general conditions index, and then we'll get to some markets. I want to talk about sentiment a bit today. I want to talk about commodities and so on. We dropped a couple of points to negative 26.09, which continues to say that recession risk going forward is far too high to ignore in our view. Starting with consumer confidence, the University of Michigan's final read for April came out. And as you can see, it is down there. So at 69, folks are still worried about inflation, starting to really worry about their job prospects. Not a great look. And you can see the same thing from the conference board. So the soft data or the consumer confidence data right here is definitely concerning. The uh, Kansas City Fed Labor Market Conditions Index continues to roll over, as you can see. And folks, seems to be very little ambiguity here that when this thing rolls over, noticeably like it has of late, recession tends to follow. And truck tonnage continues to come down a little bit. Still, you know, we still haven't created a lower low. Didn't change anything in our index, but you can see that measure is continuing to decline a bit. The Chicago Fed National Activity Index, 85 inputs right now. 20 is all there is in terms of positive inputs. 65 of the inputs were negative. We've been talking a lot about commodities lately because they've had a nice rally. I've been suggesting the last couple of weeks, last week in particular, that they're getting a bit out over their skis, as I like to say. We'll talk about copper in particular in a second, but this is the Bloomberg Commodity Index, captures a basket of commodities. So we had what are essentially negative divergences on the momentum as the price was screaming higher. Remember last week I talked about traders being offside in copper, and I, I attributed this to a short squeeze, and I said, if that's what that is, this is gonna come barreling right back down, and that's exactly what happened. Technicals were kind of leading in that direction as well. We are bullish copper long-term in a not small way. Clearly, this was an unsustainable move. It'll be very interesting to see what's going to happen this next week. The ratio between staples stocks and consumer discretionary stocks. So consumer staples, as I like to say, companies that sell the products people have to buy if they want to keep living. Consumer discretionary companies are those that sell products that people want to buy when they have extra money. What a sharp difference between the two. The ratio is nine in favor of consumer staples companies. And you can see that staples, which are in terms of the US, our second largest exposure and our core, by the way, in terms of sectors, is up 7% this year, where consumer discretionary stocks are down almost 2% this year. Folks, that has been a pretty good indicator of weakening economic conditions historically. So we need to pay very close attention to that going forward. Okay, so let's just get into some market dynamics that we haven't touched on in a while. Looking at breadth, the S&P 500 index is up 11% year-to-date. The S&P 500 index is actually up 5% year-to-date when you consider it on an equal weighted basis. So what does that tell us? That we still have historic concentration. And that is historically a warning flag for the sustainability of a, of a given rally. We like to look at the S&P compared to the number of its members trading above their 50-day moving average. This has been a very good indicator of long-time clients and, and viewers will know what I'm talking about. So here we are with a new marginal all-time high with the breadth by this metric really rolling over. Uh, you can see that it was leading into the 6% correction. Looking at the 200-day moving average, much slower moving. Same look there, negative divergence. The one I've been saying for months and months now that is concerning me the most is I couldn't imagine a worse looking NASDAQ composite advanced decline line relative to what's actually been happening in the NASDAQ composite. This is a massive bearish divergence and historically folks, this is a problematic signal. Okay, so getting into the technicals. So recall, I think it was last week where I said that if we get to that marginal new high, 
don't think we're going to be able to get there in the momentum indicators, how, how far off they were. Sure enough, that's the case. So we had a rising wedge, bearish divergences. Uh, you can see I have a red circle here. Let me just make that a little more prominent for you. I circled the uh, bearish engulfing candle. Okay, so that was that big decline on Thursday, and you can see the, the body of the candle engulf the previous four or five days. At tops, that's a pretty bearish sign. You can see we had one just off the top here. We actually had a little one right there too, I think. Um, we, uh, we had one back here in July of, uh, of last year before we got last year's correction. Same thing with the uh, NASDAQ 100 index. Even though NVIDIA had blowout earnings again, on this day when the NASDAQ was down, NVIDIA was up 10% or so. Uh, so that speaks to how bad everything else was outside of NVIDIA and those bearish divergences and so on. A bit of a bearish, uh, not quite the engulfing candle. You can see it only engulfed the prior day uh, there. But anyway, technically, market still looks very heavy to us right here. We shall see. And you know, folks, it's the dynamics that I've been talking about, right? It's been bad news is good news. Good news is bad news. Why did the market fall apart on Thursday? Well, we got pretty strong purchasing managers indices that said, you know, the economy is beginning to look up. That's been the case globally. We've talked about that a lot here of late. We've actually rotated uh, more to our global equity exposure, and that's paid off pretty nicely in our core portfolio of late. We are seeing signs of bottoming in Europe after they're kind of coming out of recession. I, I pay attention to analysts who are pretty bullish, you know, the rest of the world, cautious the U.S. I'd say we're still relatively cautious overall. I think a U.S. recession, and I think odds are, are too high to ignore, as I keep saying, uh, would do a number on the global economy as well. So I think we need to be very careful here. Make money where we can, but continue to hedge, continue to stay very diversified, and continue to stay very liquid, because I suspect that over the course of the next year, we're going to have better opportunities to be putting cash to work. Okay, so actually talking about NVIDIA actually reminds me of a note I made in our internal log this week, and I think I'll show that to you here. Okay, so a lot there that I'd love to share with you, but look for the... Um, Look for the end of next week written blog where I capture a lot of what we do here. But this is what I was writing about on Thursday. And here, I'll just read it to you. I and others have been drawing the comparison between NVIDIA, the ultimate AI infrastructure play today, and Cisco Systems, the ultimate internet infrastructure play of the late 90s. Here's a look at their respective profits. I circled Cisco's during the 90s and NVIDIA's present day, right? There's Cisco's profits in the, uh, in the 90s, late 90s, and there's NVIDIA's today, okay? And here's a look at Cisco stock performance from January of 1995 to the peak in March 2000, quite the surge there in the late 90s. And here's NVIDIA's stock performance for the past five years, right? So take a look at those, talk about similarities, right? And here's Cisco's from the peak in 2000, 24 years later to today. And you can see what happened, of course, when that tech bubble burst. Now, and I mean this sincerely, there's no reason why history would repeat, but the parallels are too significant to ignore. And frankly, NVIDIA has probably substantially more competition on the horizon today than Cisco did back in the late 90s for certain their biggest customers are in the development stage of their own AI chips. And so I, you know, I think there's a day of reckoning coming. I have no idea when that's going to be. I would not go shorting NVIDIA. It's tempting, but, um, but this, this could go on a while. Okay, so last week I said that yields and dollar and the dollar have been really the tell for uh, where equities are going, that, that the technicals on these of late have been as helpful, if not more helpful, than the technicals on the market itself, because there is just absolute negative correlation right now between yields and stocks. And, and there's last Thursday as an example. You can see what yields did, and you know the stocks went down a bunch. The Dow had its worst day in a year, down more than 600 points. 
Um, this is kind of an ambiguous chart. We'll see where yields go from here. There's, there's nothing really jumping out at me in terms of the look of the technicals. We could talk about fundamentals, but this part here, we'll just talk about the technicals. Um, with, the, uh, with the dollar, you can see the dollar spiked up on, uh, on Thursday, and that's that you know, big decline. You can see the dollar went down on Friday, and the market gained a little ground. Uh, we could actually, from a, speaking of technicals, you know, you, you could go like this and say there is a pretty compelling looking bear flag. Yeah, it gets squiggly in here and it, we just kind of keep flagging down. But if we start here, yeah, maybe I'm, maybe I'm trying too hard, but you could do that. Now, if that were to play out, right, you take the length of the flagpole and that would take us down quite a bit. And by the way, folks, that would be very bullish for stocks. The dynamics that would make that happen, that would be yields coming down as well. And as I've also been pointing out the last few weeks, while well, we have serious long-term concerns based on you know, what we think fundamental general conditions look like, in the near term, it would not surprise me to see stocks do pretty well, uh, particularly non-US stocks, but US stocks could do fine here as well because we think the data will continue to roll over That'll continue to bring hope that the Fed is going to cut interest rates, become more accommodative, however you want to say that. That's what stocks want to see. So that's kind of the world we live in right now. This will not be the world we live in throughout. Uh, but ironically, like the big down day on Thursday is what we're looking for ultimately as this cycle finally plays itself out but for different reasons. That was about PMIs coming in better than expected. Ultimately, the bottom of what we think is a continued bear market, or at least bear market conditions, will come when the Fed is cutting interest rate, but corporate profits are rolling over because we are in recession. Gold, we've got a good position in gold. It's our largest individual position. It's not our largest exposure, but it's our largest individual position underneath short-term treasuries. And um, but, you know, we flagged it there. We did cut our gold mining exposure a bit. We did buy an out of the money put about 10 percent to protect our gold position. Right in here, I said it's somewhat ambiguous. It can go in either way. It wouldn't surprise me if people started buying again. They did. Now we got a rising wedge, pretty big bearish divergences and boom, 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 boom. We've got a step down in gold. So we'll see how that plays out. We are um, nearly as bullish gold longer term as we are copper gold offers a much more defensive aspect if indeed we do get that recession versus what copper will do so we're looking for that recession if it happens as an opportunity to take on larger positions in you know industrial metals and those sorts of things because we think the next cycle that's what it's going to be largely about but if there is a recession looming you've got to be very careful going there and i know a lot of people are wanting to go there one of the largest new hedge fund offerings is about to come out commodities is going to be a central theme i wish them luck and um, they're going to take time to, to raise money so maybe they're anticipating uh, what they're after to get cheaper and i'm telling you that's what will happen if indeed these recession odds do play out over the coming you know, six to 12 months. Lastly, let's just touch on investor sentiment. Also recall that I said here recently, it's getting back out over its skis again, as I like to say. This is the individual investor, AAII, bull bear spread. I showed you here heading into 2022. The bulls were loaded up on that side of the boat. We had a real ugly 2022. A lot of bearishness heading into 2023. Market did well in 2023, and it's continued to do well in 2024. But you can see we did have that you know, six percent correction. I said it'd be five to 15, so the very low end of that. And then you know one of the things I cited along with the technicals was uh, rampant bullishness. Of course, that got wiped out very quickly with that correction. Then it came bounding right back as the market went up, and so you know a little too much right now. Our fear greed barometer uh, very much says large amount of net greed still. And I, like I said last week, you know, when you start getting concentrated on the bull side of the boat, and remember I said that investment managers, that S&P Global Index, which we participate in, our fellow respondents were giddy. We weren't as giddy, but short term, we're not all that bearish either, but we're not giddy. These folks just seem to be giddy based on the, the survey results. 
investment advisors slash newsletter writers right now are way still, even this week, way in that danger zone. The bull bear spread is at 42. So sentiment still looks concerning. More good news on the economy, hot news on inflation. If that has the bulls rushing over to the bear side of the boat, we could end up getting some more corrective action right in here. But remember what I just said a minute ago, though, that we actually think that we're going to see less of the good news, more of the concerning economic news. And for a moment, for a while, that will be good for stocks, we think, until it's obvious that it's worse than people think and that it ultimately means a U.S. recession, if indeed that's how it plays out. That's our base case right now. But like I said, we can make money in this in this environment. We're not at all disappointed in our year to date results. But um, expect lots and lots of volatility. Let me just say that with certainty. Folks, thank you so much, as always, for watching and listening. Talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.